experience and understanding of the financial markets and is also a prominent figure in the New Zealand carbon and dairy markets. <coughs> Okay, I assume that's my ticket. Is that my ticket? Oh, right, okay, green to go. I assume that uh, this was a good uh, start. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, well done for um, getting up to uh, the very first session on day two of the conference. I speak at a few of these conferences, so I know what it's like to sort of be here sort of on, early on day two. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, I'm just going to run through um, a, a quick presentation on really pricing carbon and what carbon means in today's market. So, um, as Adrian mentioned, Nigel Brown's my name. I run Institutional Commodities at IMF, IMF Markets. And just to give you a little bit of context about um, who we are and what we do, basically we are a commodities broker, um, and there's three main markets that we deal in, uh, renewables, which is really carbon, carbon markets and renewable energy markets, and Australia, New Zealand and Europe. Um, we're also quite active in the energy space, uh, wholesale um, electricity, gas, um, dealing with a lot of generators and industrials, um, and also we're quite active in the agriculture space, and if you know anything about New Zealand, we have a, um, a fair share of cows, basically only 3% of global milk production, but 40% of global trade, just to give some context on uh, how much milk we don't drink over there and, and how much um, we export. So I just wanted to run through in the next sort of about 15 minutes, um, just a few things. Um, interesting, when I was asked to come do this presentation a couple of months ago, um, I was sort of writing a presentation that we'd have a change of government. So uh, about a month ago, I basically had to rip that presentation up and uh, sort of start again. But um, anyway, I'll cover Australian carbon policy, talk about the Paris Agreement, which is um, uh, coming up, and then touch a little bit on sort of responsibilities for boards and companies around dealing with um, climate, what customer expectations are, the two markets that sit out there, um, and how carbon is being priced globally as well as internally, and then just a final sort of slide about how you can, um, what you really need to be doing about emissions. I suppose what's interesting is that when I sort of look at the gold market, for example, and go, well, here's, a, here's an industry or a sector that actually uses a lot of energy um, to uh, pull the gold, gold out of the ground, but its emissions are actually very small. Um, on a global context, but nevertheless, it's now getting to the point where it doesn't matter how small your emissions are, everyone's doing something about it, and most companies are. And what's interesting, if you look at countries around the world that sort of have quite small emissions on a global basis, like Australia's sort of 1.3, 1.5% <coughs> of global emissions, if you actually add up all the countries around the world that are less than 1.5% of global emissions, they add up to over 30% of emissions. So it's not a situation where people would just say, well, we're really tiny, um, we're not going to do anything. Um, it really is a case of sort of everyone having to. So obviously, um, it's pretty much business as usual here in, uh, in Australia in regards to um, carbon policy. The re-election of the coalition government has really just seen um, a continuation of their policies, which their goal under the Paris Agreement is to reduce emissions between 26 and 28 per cent um, by 2030 on 2005 levels. And they've got two main mechanisms in order to do that. And quite interesting, if you actually read today's Australian and Finn Review, there's quite a good article talking about how Australia is actually on track to meet that Paris goal with the amount of renewable energy projects that are actually in the pipeline. So Australia's well on track, but what I'll show you in another couple of slides, what's happening globally is simply not enough to meet that Paris commitment. So there's two main mechanisms that Australia has in, in dealing with emissions. The first is the Emission Reduction Fund, which has around, actually it's just been updated to be around three, three and a half billion of public money that every six months the Australian government come into the marketplace and buy emissions um, uh, from the private sector. So people who are doing emission reduction projects that reduce emissions are effectively selling those to the government. And also, uh, so that, if you look at a, Australia's carbon policy, a little bit like a penny farthing, sort of the big wheel is the emission reduction fund, and the small wheel is the safeguard mechanism, which is a bit of a baseline and pricing system applying to different sectors and companies that if they exceed a certain baseline, 
per year and they have to go out and source carbon credits and actually hand those to the government. And that's only been done in a very small way and it's mainly impacted the coal sector. So that's a sort of the current um, main two thrusts of the coalition carbon policy. There are a number of other measures out there, um, such as, you know, movement to electric vehicles and, and uh, pumped hydro and a num number of other um, uh, things that are a suite of measures, but those are two main things. So looking at the Paris Agreement, which um, it's interesting, uh, this was sort of signed and ratified sort of back in 2015, and effectively what everyone on the planet, and this is different to the Kyoto Agreement, where only developed countries were responsible for reducing emissions. <coughs> Under the Paris Agreement, everyone has basically stepped up, including the US. Even though they've, they've said that they're going to withdraw, they have to give four years notice in order to do that, so they're still part of the Paris Agreement. And what, what that agreement effectively says is that everyone is going to effectively turn up starting from, April, from January 2021 and reduce their emissions in such a way that the Paris goal is to reduce temperature rise to ideally one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels by 2030. Uh, and what's interesting about that is um, almost half the countries that have signed up to the Paris Agreement cannot do that domestically. Uh, and what's also interesting is that present commitments including Australia and many others, it simply doesn't go far enough. And this chart, if you can see that, you'll see that dotted line, that black line sort of leading up to um, the dotted line is sort of 2%. So the current um, nationally determined contributions by all countries that have turned up and signed and ratified Paris is actually leading to a three degree world, according to um, those emission reduction pledges. So starting in 2021 and then in 2025, they're going to have to ramp that up considerably if you see that dotted line to where we need to get to, to ideally to be one and a half degrees um, above pre-industrial levels. So that's what's happening at an international level. Um, what's happening um, at a shareholder, company, customer level is a little bit different. Um, Boards are now realising um, that they have fiduciary responsibilities to actually understand and reduce emissions. And there is a very big trend in um, litigation against companies that are not dealing with their emissions or facing what their risks are within their business. In fact, there's been, as, as of the middle of last year, there's been over 1,100 um, climate change cases filed globally. Uh, and there was one filed against the CBA a couple of years ago that has since dropped, and one against people in the US. So there is actually people walking to court, taking action against companies that are not addressing uh, climate change issues within um, their own organisations. And when you think, why would someone do that to a bank? You don't necessarily see those as big admitters. Well, they're not, but the, 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 the thrust of the case against CBA was really around the fact that they weren't addressing the risks in their property portfolio around coastal regions and the impact of potential impact of sea level rise. So they certainly started to address that in, in, um, in future um, reporting and certainly in their annual, annual reports. But it actually comes down to customer expectations as well. Um, there is a group out there, you can look this up, LOHAS, L-O-H-A-S, which is the Life Styles of Health and Sustainability. And it was a group of people identified within an economy. They say that it's about 30% of the US economy that are making purchasing decisions based on health and sustainability. These are the people that tip the box on the airline uh, to offset the carbon emissions. These are people buying the permanent coffee cups. These are the people that are making decisions around what they buy based on health and sustainability, and it's a very big part of the market. Um, and if they see a product, if they, obviously they expect the product to be good, but they also are looking behind the label to see what um, is happening um, in regards to you know, how those companies deal with um, sustainability. And there's also a big expectation from shareholders that companies will now um, address emissions. And as you're probably aware with the new ESG approach from fund managers, which is around environmental, um, social sustainability and governance, um, a lot of fund managers now are taking a very um, different approach in regards to how they invest. 
including divesting from companies that had large fossil fuel um, mm. parts of their business. So really now, when a fund manager, including those investors and the fund managers themselves from an environmental perspective, are actually looking at whether the company they're investing in are a good steward of nature, this is happening. When RFPs are going out from fund managers and big, large investment banks around the world, there are a slot in those RFPs talking about ESG and the expectation of people. So things are changing uh, quite dramatically. And I suppose just to lead on to the sort of two carbon markets. So the compliance carbon market is one that you see based around the Kyoto mechanism and soon to be the Paris mechanism. This is where countries have an emissions trading scheme um, or, a, or a carbon tax within their business and they levy that on their highest emissions. And the other people that, are, that they expect, expect to offset emissions and actually through a compliance market, you know, such as your large coal users or your large energy users, whether that be fuel or so forth. But there's also the voluntary market. Now, a few years ago, the voluntary market, or what I used to call the feel-good market, was basically companies that could <laughs> offset emissions from a market perspective to, to maybe market to the low hash that I talked about previously, but really to do it from a marketing perspective. That's now changed for those other points that I've mentioned. Companies now are looking at their emissions from a voluntary perspective, and even large companies here in Australia that feel the government has not taken enough action on climate change are starting to look at their own emissions from a voluntary perspective, um, from large emissions right down to small. And what's going to happen when the Paris Agreement starts if every country in the world's got to turn up and start to reduce their emissions? They're going to look at the emissions that they're importing into over their borders and have some expectation that those countries that they're buying energy from, whether it be coal or gas or anything that has emissions in it, there'll be an expectation that those emissions are being offset or reduced. <coughs> so that voluntary market is growing quite substantially. So companies that may not necessarily have a compliance obligation within an emissions trading scheme in the country nevertheless are starting to address um, their own emissions. And again, it's not just because they want to feel good about themselves, it's because the expectation from their customers, it's the climate change cases that are rising globally, it's the fiduciary responsibility in those boards. It's the fact that a lot of people now are starting to, to price their own market and I, well, their own emissions. And I suppose it's interesting if you look at global carbon prices in the compliance market, so the top line here You've got the European price up around $40 Australian, so this chart needs to be updated, it's trading around 40 In New Zealand, we've got um, our car pricing around $25 a tonne. Australia, there's two lines there. The little, little short line sitting around $15, $16 is the price of carbon here in Australia, and the line underneath is the price that's met by the Emission Reduction Fund. People are saying that if we want to get to one and a half degrees, by 2030, what does that mean for carbon pricing? If you want to go from fossil fuels to renewable energy, you say, what's the price of carbon need to be? Well, people like Stiglitz, the Nobel Laureate, Lord Stern from the UK, uh, IPCC, the World Bank, are all saying that we need to see carbon prices between 75 and 125 US dollars a tonne by 2030. And the World Bank just came out very recently, only in the last few weeks, and said, we believe that having a price on carbon is an effective mechanism, but current carbon prices are far too low in order to bring about change. So it's not just about technology that needs to come forward at the right carbon price, but the carbon price needs to be right so that people in the street are prepared to make changes around their own um, emissions. And if you even look internally, so this was sort of plucked out of the um, uh, uh, financial review for any of those companies that are actually on this list and perhaps sitting in the room. Um, this is sort of public information, but this is not new. These are companies that are actually starting to price carbon internally, and this is a global trend. Um, you know, no matter where you look in whatever economy around the world, you are seeing internal carbon prices being priced by business <coughs> themselves within their own um, businesses. And if you look up there, you know, a couple of them like, um, that are well known, you know, BHP, um, Origin, Rio Tinto, even Santos, as you can see, they are well above 
uh, and they're upper end by 2030 of where they see carbon prices going. So action is being taken by these, these companies. They have large teams within their businesses looking at their overall emissions. This is nothing new. And just, just finally, probably just for um, sort of bringing it back to where, where you guys are over the next couple of days, um, because it is about you know, sustainability, renewable energy, and starting to look at, at, at new ways of producing energy. So I think it's really, really important that you understand uh, what your footprint is um, and calculate it, um, because it's, it's really about firstly reducing uh, emissions within your own business, depending on how you do that, and there's a number of ways to do that, certainly utilising technologies to reduce emissions, and then offset the rest through offsets. And a final point about that, offsets can be a range of different things, and they don't have to be domestic offsets. There are a number of very good offset projects around the world, not just here in Australia, but in other countries in Africa, you know, getting, getting people in parts of Africa or less developed countries are moving away from using oil and, and kerosene and that for lighting and actually move to solar, so it's much healthier, so it has other social benefits and co-benefits. Um, but to bear in mind that when these emission reductions are happening, there's only one atmosphere. So as long as the project's a good project and it's reducing emissions and it has other social benefits and co-benefits, um, then other projects that you should be looking at. So if there's anything um, further I can help any of you with, my details and that are in the program, I believe, I think on the last slide, I've got that where I can be contacted. So if any of you are wanting to have a look at um, your emissions in a much more granular way, um, you know, we're very happy to help you um, understand that. And um, I think I'll probably tie it up there, Adrian. If there was any questions or anything, um, please feel free to ask. Questions for Nigel. That's Good. novel. That's novel. <laughs> Good for Rich Energetics. Thanks, Mark. Nigel, that was a great uh, coverage. I think maybe one other area that may be of interest to this is the impact of the task force <laughs> on climate related financial disclosures. Yeah, sorry, repeat that last bit. The, the T TCFD. Yeah, okay. So, um, Okay, so I'm not fully aware of that, I'm talking about here domestically in Australia. Yeah, you know, there definitely, uh, and it sort of harks back to my earlier point, there is, it's, 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 I think it's coming from both the top down and the bottom up pressure um, in regards to people actually being, um, uh, and I mean, it's, it's not just that, I mean, there's ASIC and there's, you know, there's the APRA insurance company side of the monitoring of the businesses that are actually coming out and actually, you know, saying, look, you've got to actually, do something about this and actually be full, you know, fully understand what your what your risks are within the business uh, and how you disclose those, right? So I think that's going to continue to step up. I think we're seeing that around the world already, um, with the number of um, <coughs> climate change related cases that have been done globally. I think now people are starting to realise that there are a number of risks. We're seeing that in a lot of places like New Zealand around the coastal areas and around the impacts on the councils and all that kind of stuff around uh, properties that sit around the coast. So I think you're going to see that will continue um, to become more relevant and more important as we move forward. <laughs> Has that ever been dropped in the last day or so? Is it? Yeah. It, it can be dropped. It can be dropped on the Anybody else? Okay. Uh, it's you. No. <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> 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 Hi, Steve Grab, um, Tilbury of Metal Street. I noticed on the uh, list that you put up showing um, people who are already pricing carbon, um, are really people that produce products that further generate carbon to the next seller. Do they price that carbon offset using the amount of carbon that will be generated by that product? Are you sort of more talking about the fact how many times is the carbon counted? Yes. Yeah, so well, theoretically, um, it should only be counted once, right? So um, you'll find that in most countries that have a compliance regime like an emissions trading scheme, and if you talk about coal, for instance, or fuel, um, 
when the coal is basically taken out of the ground and then shipped to that user, at that point, the carbon is priced and captured at that point. Interesting, it's around two tonnes of carbon for every tonne of coal. Um, and in a lot of economies actually capture coal for emissions, so it's at that point. Um, so you really only, only can count it once, right? So, um, and that's what, what's going to be interesting about that. So, so if, if you're buying coal from someone and, and using it, and there's a price of carbon within that economy, like an emissions trading scheme, then the price of that carbon that's there, obviously it's going to be consumed will be priced at that point. So if you then take that coal and burn it, you've already paid for the carbon within that. Um, but what's going to be interesting is, is that the export of coal out of Australia, so the export of coal out of Australia to countries starting from 2021, those countries are going to have, they are going to be the ones wearing the carbon price on that import of that coal. And there may be pressures put on country that export things such as coal, such as gas, um, to actually state carbon credits to those exports to actually account for cover um, for the emissions that come from that coal. Um, so it's really only, uh, in, in an emissions, from an emissions perspective and accounting perspective, it's captured once, um, and that's it. But on the voluntary market, what's interesting, if you go onto airlines and offset your emissions on an airline, you're offsetting the fuel, which has actually already been captured in the emissions trading scheme. But people are quite happy to do that because they realise that those reductions don't go far enough and they're happy to double down as well, as opposed to double counting. So it's at the source of the emissions where it's captured. Uh, a bit of a follow-up to that then, because we had a, a big uh, discussion, I guess, in the last eight weeks around uh, LNG projects and the carbon dioxide they bring up uh, in the lead up to the election. And, uh, and the EPA and what they're doing at the moment. So in your view, how did they get counted when they're not actually uh, produced per se in the process, they come up as a byproduct of, of, uh, of a mining or resource process? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question because um, what tends to happen in countries that have um, emissions trading schemes, um, that's really weird. <coughs> If, you, uh, if you're not going to have an efficient mechanism for actually capturing all the effectively emission data that comes out of that, then um, you're going to miss a lot of those things, right? So in New Zealand, which has a um, all gases, all sectors emissions trading scheme, um, and in other countries that have emissions trading schemes, in China, that's about to start the emissions trading scheme next year, there's an immense amount of work done defining what emission factors are and where those emissions are actually being caused to make sure that they're being captured, even though carbon leakage is not the right term to use in that instance. Um, but in New Zealand, for example, which is, you know, even though our office is in Australia and in Sydney, um, you know, I, I operate out of uh, New Zealand a fair bit, you know, all those processes have been accounted for. There's been a lot of work done around exactly working out what an emission is and how it's created to make sure that everything has been captured that may not necessarily be done to the same extent in Australia because they effectively don't have an emissions trading scheme. I would, I would say though that those, <coughs> those facts probably would be known, but whether or not they're being drawn into one complete sort of process or place in regards to working out how those emissions are, but, um, but in certainly countries that have emissions trading schemes, they, they, they are efficient in that. Because in reality, if you sign up to an international agreement and you have emissions and you have a national or national greenhouse gas inventory, you have to be very accurate around that. So a lot of work has actually been done around that to make to ensure that all those emissions that do occur are captured uh, somehow in regards to the data. Awesome. Thank you very much.